Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Ask IoT episode from IoT for All, the number one publication and resource for the Internet of Things. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon. On today's episode, we have Robbie Hamlet, the CEO and president of Teal. They are an IoT networking company headquartered in Seattle, Washington. They are the first, they have built the first cloud native credentialing as a service platform that provides intelligent connectivity and network solutions to IoT device and network operators. Um, fantastic company. We've had them on many times. Robbie's great. Um, we on this episode we are focused on a single topic uh, like all the other Ask IoT episodes. This one is about eSIM versus SIM versus iSIM. We talk about the differences between the different um, technologies as well as why are there so many IoT companies rushing to adopt eSIM technology, kind of the reasoning behind all that. What do eSIM tech platforms like Teal provide that um, an MVNO or an MNO cannot? Uh, as well as is eSIM technology complementary to carriers? Uh, kind of all around uh, different topics around that, around those those points. Um, but by the end of this, you'll have a pretty good idea of what the difference between those three are. Welcome, Robbie. Thanks for being here again. Yeah, thanks for having me again. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so quickly, just in case our audience hasn't maybe seen some of the other videos you've participated in and um, maybe not as familiar with Teal, quick overview of Teal as well as a quick intro about yourself. Yeah, my name is Robbie Hamlet. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Teal. My background was in eSIM engineering, so worked on some very early connected car solutions saw kind of the first iterations of eSIM technology and saw the problems that I wanted to solve uh, with Teal. So um, you know, building building out a platform for connecting a device to as many networks as possible. Fantastic. So today's conversation, we're going to talk about SIMs versus eSIMs versus iSIM, what the difference is, kind of how they compare, what you should be thinking about when you hear these terms. Uh, so first question I have for you is explain the difference between the three different technologies. Yeah, so... Uh, we at Teal think about these technologies very broadly. We're thinking about an architecture of identity components. And so each of them fundamentally is carrying like the identity that you're going to present to the network. And it's going to decide what networks you get to access as a result. So a SIM card traditionally is just like a plastic um, card like you get for um, like a regular phone. Um, you might see at an airport or at a shopping mall or something. Mm -hmm. um, and you can take it out of the device and you can put it in other devices. It's kind of hot swappable. Um, and then it started to include kind of programmable functionality uh, at the same time that people were starting to embed those SIM cards into devices. So the, the need for an ability to change the identity of the SIM, if it's program or like if it's embedded on the board, then kind of rolled back into traditional SIM card form factors because if you can't take the SIM in and out of a device because it's just soldered on the motherboard, mm -hmm. you still want that flexibility to be able to act like you're switching it in and out of device. And eSIM, you know, we know hasn't led up to that promise just yet. It's not quite that easy. Okay. Um, but eSIM is an embedded SIM card um, that can be electronically programmed. It can still be, an eSIM can be a plastic card that's an EUICC. So a SIM card's a UICC and eSIM's an EUICC. And then an iSIM is an IEUICC. So it still has all the programmability, yeah, IEUICC, yeah. Um, an integrated uh, embedded uh, universal integrated circuit card. <laughs> it's a, a definite, definite uh, tongue twister of an acronym. But um, iSIM is doing all the things that eSIM can do, but it's included in kind of the SOC package. So inside of the the processor silicon, that's the wafer that's spat out of the factory. It can be included there. Um, it can be a chiplet design where all the silicon's inside of one um, mm -hmm. kind of chip enclosure. I'm trying to see if I have an example of a chip on my board or on my desk. But, um, you know, just like if you look at any CPU, the iSIM right. is actually inside of that package as opposed to being a chip that's soldered somewhere else on the motherboard. Gotcha. Fantastic. Um, so I guess, you know, a lot of the conversations I've had in the past uh, eSIM comes up very often. Um, iSIM maybe not as much, but why are so many companies kind of rushing to adopt eSIM technology? Everybody's trying to figure it out. Um, okay. iSIM can lead to some really vertically integrated solutions because you're no longer having to source a part separately. Um, ideally, it's going to make everybody's lives early, easier. Mm -hmm. And um, I say that ideally because if you look at early eSIM, um, it still hasn't regained, it, not regained, it's never actually achieved its its true promise. The tooling has to catch up. So um, like eSIM um, 
hasn't there there isn't yet a process and this is what what teal's built there isn't really a, a good process for building a device with an eSIM and then personalizing it with the carriers that you want if you get an eSIM from somebody you're kind of limited to to who provided you that eSIM so if you get an eSIM from T-Mobile it's only going to access T-Mobile it's not the kind of eSIM that you can take and move to AT&T or Verizon it's not actually programmable same way um, if you're getting it from some other um, type of provider, um, you're really limited to what they're doing. So the tooling yet hasn't caught up okay. to just start to embed eSIM. Um, but it's it's now getting there. iSIM is going to take a while as well. The okay. carriers haven't really adopted iSIM yet. Carriers haven't fully adopted eSIM yet. Um, you have to go into a T-Mobile store in order to activate an eSIM on a consumer line, for example. Okay. Um, for iSIM to catch on, the um, people that are providing these solutions, the module manufacturers, they have to provide really good backends for people to be able to then personalize because nobody wants to be stuck buying their connectivity from Sierra Wireless now all of a sudden and then mm. being limited by the solutions that Sierra Wireless provides. When I say tooling and process, I mean like there has to be some kind of functionality for the control of that ISIM to be given over to the solution provider so that they gotcha. can decide on what they want to decide as far as the network provider identity, things like that. So when you're thinking about eSIM technology, is it there uh, any kind of, is it kind of viewed as kind of complementary to carriers or is it kind of separate? Like how do, how do you kind of frame that? It should be, it should be driven in a complementary way. It should be something that is um, creating more revenue for them because in a in a broader if you're if you're building a device like let's say you're buying uh, or building a um like a bunch of solar panels in mm -hmm. and you're going to connect this um you need connectivity for them so you use an eSIM powered um cellular solution um right now everybody is either team coca-cola or team pepsi and you're either going to roll out your your um solar panels with one carrier or the other um, mm. And if you wanted to do others, there's a really complicated process of physically swapping out components at the site, doing site surveys, maybe rolling trucks if you have issues there. Um, but the carriers are kind of taking a big swing, like a home run cut and saying like, it's all or nothing. We're either going to get all the business or we're going to get none of it. It's certainly not going to be easy to add them into the picture later. Mm. eSIM allows for a more dynamic delivery model of their network. Um, but what concerns operators is it can't be so dynamic that um, everybody is going to be undercutting themselves all the time. And okay. so economically, there's there's been a lot of re that's that's the main reason why eSIM hasn't hasn't caught on from a lot of the carriers is they're not they're very concerned about the business rules that are put in place as to why you would switch. Right. Because you don't want to be know. using one carrier only when it's cheapest and the other carrier only when that one's cheapest. They right. kind of want a mix of usage. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Great. Last question before I let you go here. Um, so what then do eSIM platforms similar to kind of to yourself um, provide that an MVNO or an MNO can't? Yeah, the, the main thing is just overall control. So Teal's um, value to the market and to, to solutions is that we're a SIM technology provider first. So we're very focused on the credentialing technology. We've done all of our development in-house. We're not using you know, a third party to drive our eSIM solution and telling that third party only use our agreements. We've built something that allows people to, to bring their own kind of solutions into it. If they want to add a private network that's completely outside of the relationships that Teal manages, they can do so. Um, if they want to add a carrier that doesn't, you know, hasn't adopted eSIM, you know, Teal's more than happy to onboard um, that carrier for that partner. Um, so, you know, thinking about like how we can save um, eSIM and iSIM from this, from or how we can save iSIM from the um, limitations of eSIM, right? eSIM has been out for 10 years, mm -hmm. but we don't have that availability yet to say, I'm going to ship a device and I'm going to change the carrier at the site and it's going to live natively in that carrier. Right. Um, I For iSIM to avoid the same fate, there has to be some kind of neutral layer. There has to be some kind of um, Switzerland that exists. Teal is built to be that Switzerland so that okay. that identity management is done kind of um, with the carrier's permission and right. the device maker's control. Fantastic. And for our audience out there who wants to maybe follow up on this topic, learn more, ask questions, get in touch, best way to do that? 
LinkedIn, Twitter, email, all good. Um, yeah. Hello at cool. tealcom.io or, or a LinkedIn message is, is all good. Awesome. Well, Robbie, thanks again for your time, man. It's been great. I really appreciate you kind of sharing your expertise here. Thanks, Ryan. All right, everyone. Thanks again for watching that episode of the Ask IoT video series. I hope you found a lot of value in it. If you did, please be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. It helps others find it and make sure that you get the latest episodes as soon as they come available. Other than that, if you have any questions or topics that you would like us to cover in this series, please leave them in the comments or shoot us an email at hello at iotforall.com. Other than that, thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.